Welcome to Classic Game Room, coming to you from the future. A future where Atari won the console war of the mid-1980s, crushing the NES into oblivion. Nintendo who? They're just some old company that makes card games. You know why? Because the Atari 7800 makes you a professional. It made me a professional back in 1987 when all the other losers on my block were busy playing Metroid and Super Mario Brothers or whatever. I was busy playing Xevious and Robotron 2084 Joust and Ms. Pac-Man on my Atari 7800. I love the 7800. In fact, many of my earliest reviews from the classic Game Room HD era in 2008-2009 were Atari 7800 games. So let's check it out here in Best Atari 7800 Reviews by Classic Game Room. Dig it. It's the 7800 Pro System. It's beautiful. Even without wood grain, it makes an impact. It makes you and me professionals. If you grew up on the NES, I'm sorry, that makes you an amateur. Hey, stick around to the end because I've got a surprise for you. Until then, enjoy a diverse collection of reviews spanning a 15-year period of Classic Game Room all about the Atari 7800. Enjoy. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Crossbow on Atari 7800, which uses the Atari Light Gun. Which means if you have two TVs and a zapper, you can play Duck Hunt and Crossbow at the same time. The game is Crossbow, originally a 1983 arcade game. Here it is being played on the Atari 7800, the Pro System. Which makes me a professional Crossbow player. What you do in Crossbow is save these people who are walking as slowly as possible through dangerous environments filled with hazards. Rambo style. Green path, where's that take? And you choose the path through the game. Now I previously reviewed the Atari 2600 version, but the 7800 version seen here is compatible with the Atari light gun, which is the way Crossbow was meant to be played. Fortunately, I'm not being scored for my accuracy. The gun fires a bit down and to the right, so I'm trying to make adjustments while still killing everything around my slow-moving people. Who you'd think would be moving a little faster as they were fleeing Mordor wherever this is, but nope, they just take their sweet-ass time. But hey, you get bonus points if these morons make it in one piece. You guys could have run a little faster there, you know? And occasionally, you even make some new friends. Now, the Atari 2600 version was played with the joystick. There isn't a light gun for that thing. And it was a pretty good version of the game for the Atari 2600, but this is vastly superior. Even though the light gun is not terribly accurate and there's no calibration screen, you can at least aim all over the screen quickly. Something you really can't do with the joystick or gamepad. This cartridge is still playable with the Atari 7800 controller or Sega Genesis controller, whatever plugs into your 7800. And you can move a cursor around the screen, but it, it's way better with the light gun. I've never seen the arcade game, but the sounds and visuals are pretty good for the Atari 7800. It's, it's a fun game. Crossbow is definitely worth owning if you're one of the few that has the light gun. This is actually the light gun that came with the Atari XE computer, so thank you, Mark from Fresh Meadows, for that. If you're gonna play Crossbow, hunt down an Atari light gun. Although, to be honest, I'm not sure how many games use it on the Atari 7800 or the Atari computer. 
This one is pretty good though, it's always a bit different each time you play the game. So you're not just memorizing patterns. Back to the cave. And it gets tricky as your friends are attacked by a myriad diverse group of enemies, including bats and snakes and even the snow monster from The Empire Strikes Back. The game ends when all of your friends die horribly, stabbed in the head by icicles or eaten by giant birds. One wonders why they're your friends. Making your way through the game is a bit of a puzzle as you choose your path. But it's not really clear what path you have to take to get to the end, although I have to tell you I love the castle level. Run! Get, get, move! This is a fun game. It packs a lot of replay value, some good challenge. You don't need the light gun, but I highly recommend it if you're collecting for the Atari 7800. Well, good for you, for starters. I love the 7800. And this game is definitely worth owning. What the hell is that? So thank you to Gary from Ridgewood, New, New Jersey. Jersey! For sending Crossbow to Classic Game Room. This is one of those games you can rub in the face of your NES collecting friends. Hey, you may have Super Mario Brothers, but the Atari 7800's got Crossbow and Ninja Golf, so screw you. Isn't that beautiful? I love the Atari 7800 intro screen because it means I'm a professional at playing Atari. And this is the review of Super Circus Atari Age on the Atari 7800 Pro System based on the classic Circus Atari for Atari 2600. A beautiful reimagining of Circus Atari, a game where you kill clowns over and over and over again, and score points while you're at it. But I would say the objective is really to kill as many clowns as possible. Even though you're scored for the balloons, that's dumb, whatever. Pro tip everyone, use your gamepad or joystick or whatever on the left controller port and your paddle controllers on the right controller port. You need this to select the menus or make changes on the menus. We'll turn the classic mode on here. And then we'll go down here to paddle controller. Or you could use driving controller, but I'm going to use paddle controller. Oh no! One less clown to worry about. It's like I've said for years, the only good clown is a clown encased in a half mile of concrete and shot into the sun. Which I think was the plot of Superman 4. Anyway, speaking of Superman, speaking of movies, nothing gets me angrier than time traveling movies where the main characters go back in time to save the world. But what world are they saving? Is it a world? Where Nintendo won the console war of the mid-1980s because that's not a world worth saving. Look at the pickle we're in. This is because people didn't buy the Atari 7800. Instead, for some inexplicable reason, they bought NESs back in like 85, 86 and played Super Mario Brothers instead of Robotron 2084 on their Atari 7800 Pro system, if people were more professional, the world would be like this unimaginable utopia where everyone would solve their problems with combat instead of with real tanks 
And we'd fix global warming because we'd all play basic programming and be smarter. And nobody would suffer from a fear of missing out when we're all playing Yar's Revenge. If you're gonna go back in time, in addition to seeing Star Wars for the first time before they screwed it up, you'd better sabotage Nintendo's NES launch so that Atari would be the dominant game console of the next millennium. Since that's not likely to happen, what we need to do is make Atari the dominant game system of the next millennium anyway, starting right here on the Atari 7800, which is the best game console ever created with the word pro in the title because it also plays Atari 2600 games and works with the paddle controllers on Super Circus Atari Age. You know what the NES doesn't have? Paddle controllers. I mean, there's probably some paddle except, you know what, you know what the NES doesn't have? Proper Atari paddle controllers. I think there's like an Arkanoid gamepad, which is kind of okay. But proper Atari controllers are the way to go. Atari paddle controllers. Or driving controllers, which work with this game. So for those of you who collect Atari, and like you have all the Atari stuff except for some reason you don't have the paddle controllers, you just have the driving controllers for Indy 500, no fear, <laughs> they'll work right here on this game. That rhymes. Chat point. Yeah! In my future, El Camino's fly in space, the Atari Jaguar replaces the Apple Watch, and Led Zeppelin just plays through the ether. Like, you don't even need speakers, it's just the soundtrack to reality. In my future, new games are still being released for the Atari 7800 Pro system, and even though this isn't technically my future, if it was, it would be way more awesome because of those other things I said, but we're still getting new Atari 7800 games, because thankfully there's a few other people out there who love Atari even more than I do. Or maybe they don't love Atari more than I do, they're just better at making games than I am, which doesn't take much, I... Well, I don't know how to do that. But you know what I do know how to do? Drink beer and talk about Atari. Congratulations! This game is great, and that says a lot considering how much I hate clowns. I find it infuriating that you're scored for popping the balloons instead of murdering the clowns, but whatever, at least we get better graphics so you can watch the clowns die in greater detail. If you look really closely, you can see their brains running out from their ears. So for those of you who don't know, Circus Atari is a lot like Breakout, except instead of bouncing the block or the ball into the bricks with a paddle, you're bouncing it into the balloons with clowns on a teeter-totter. And you, you probably figured it out from watching the gameplay, but you have to collect the clown on the left side to bounce the clown on the right side and, and, and vice versa. And I think the clowns kind of look like Mario, don't they? Let's go and die. Oh no, my brain is splattered all over the floor. Pushing the button on the controller will switch the side of the teeter-totter that the clown is on. And there's power-ups, so kind of like Arkanoid. And uh, you can play this game with the joystick, Paddle controller, driving controller, there's a couple other options, and this is from the fine folks at Atari Age. Not sure if it's still in print, but it's very good. And if you like Circus Atari or Breakout or Super Breakout, I think you'll love it. And remember, kids, Atari does what Nintendo don't. Mark's demented future, Princess Peach is dating Popeye. And who can blame her?
This is Galaga for the Atari 7800, and this is another classic arcade title that's made a really nice transition to the Atari 7800. And this is a great version of this game. In fact, uh, I know Galaga has recently made it to the Xbox 360 and Xbox Live, and I actually prefer the uh, Atari 7800 version. I think the speed of the game is a, just a bit slower, and that makes the games last longer, and I think that makes them a bit more challenging and a bit more fun. Every now and then one of the aliens comes down with a tractor beam and you can let them capture your spaceship and then you shoot it, you shoot them, and then you get your spaceship back and then you have a double spaceship which you can really wreak havoc upon the enemy fleet with. Uh, two laser blasts is, as we all know, much better than just one laser blast. And then you get to the challenge stages where they throw wave after wave at you. And if you can shoot all of the enemies in the challenge stage, you are rewarded with a very high bonus. And this is much easier to do if you have two spaceships instead of just one. And the music in this game is just awesome. This is up there with the Pac-Man theme or Spy Hunter. And this is just classic arcade music here. As the game progresses, the alien formations come down at you a lot faster, they shoot at you more, and the game gets much more difficult. And, uh, and if you happen to lose one of your dual spaceships, you are left then with a single spaceship to, to fight wave after wave of enemy with, and that makes it uh, really hard. I don't know what it is about shooting aliens, but it never gets boring. And this game is worth picking up the Atari 7800 game system for, just so you have Galaga. That's how good this is. Welcome to Classic Game Room, broadcasting from a closet inside the Intergalactic Space Arcade. This is the review of Cracked on the Atari 7800. Cheers. After spending an inordinate amount of time blowing up things with spaceships and slaying zombies, it's nice to play a game where your objective is to save chicken eggs from abduction. This is Cracked from 1988 for the Atari 7800 Pro System. And you'll need to be a pro to get anywhere in this game. Cracked is really hard. It feels like a game originally designed to be played with a light gun. Instead, you use your Atari 7800 controller. And those of us familiar with the awkward design of the 7800 controller can probably feel the pain playing this just watching the video. It hurts, so I'd recommend Something like the Atari 7800 gamepad or a Genesis controller instead. Move your cursor around the screen and shoot enemies before they swipe your eggs. And if you shoot them while they're carrying an egg off screen like Defender, you can pick up the egg and place it back in the nest. That's probably why you don't use a light gun for this game, but it, uh, it's, it's just tough. The controls are touchy and the enemies are fast. You can fit a maximum of five eggs in one nest, and you can rewind the video to the beginning to watch where I screwed that up once. 
One strategy is just to hover over one or two nests and try to keep them safe, but in the end, the creatures always win. I like that the game progresses through levels like a forest, the sewers, underwater, Castlevania, and outer space. What do squids and the undead need with eggs anyway? I question the realism of Cracked. Seems like somebody just made this game up. Obviously, you're scored for blowing up enemies and rescuing eggs, but also you get bonus points depending on how many eggs you have left over, which probably won't be very many. There's three difficulty settings, easy, normal, and insane, and I would consider the easy insane, so I'm not sure how insane insane is. Probably really insane. This is not a mainstream game by any means. You won't find it on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Just the Atari 7800 Pro System. This was sent to the show by Joseph in the Bronx, New York. So thank you, Joseph. I think this is a cool game for 7800 collectors because it's kind of different. It's tough. The controls are really touchy, so it takes some time to get used to them. But it's a neat, catchy game that's probably not one of the game cartridges you already have. Also, you can tell people, I'm high on Cracked, and they'll look at you like you're crazy. Occasionally, you get to play this rooster ranch scene, which I found pretty annoying, so I would just throw all my eggs away. I can never hit the damn roosters anyway, so let's just move on to space, because I'm saving eggs from aliens. Can't aliens just lay their own eggs, which hatch, and then attach themselves to people's faces? Everything I know I learned from movies. Nah, I lost another egg in the vacuum of space. Cracked ain't whack. Cracked is good. Especially when played on the Atari 7800 Pro System. The game console of the future. It's never too late for the 7800 to get the respect it deserves. People, get out of my way! Let me save the ladies! Somebody's gotta repopulate the species. <laughs> and it's gonna, well, never mind, I'm dead. Eighty-four reasons why the Atari 7800 is better than the NES and you're looking at all of them at once on screen it's Robotron 2084 one of my favorite video games being played properly on the Atari 7800 save the last human family they don't even thank me they don't need to Great to have this game back. I had to part with my copy during the big purge a couple years ago. Picked up a boxed, a new bo another boxed copy of Robotron over the weekend. My visit down to Nashville for the Music City Multicon. It's the only game I wanted to buy. <laughs> but I was like, are you buying another copy of Trucks? And I'm like, no. <laughs> what I need is Robotron. Because I'm making a big Robotron review for the upcoming second season of Classic Game Room 2085. And, like, I just, this is the one I grew up on, so I gotta have Robotron. And I kind of forgot how good it is. I've played it in a while. It's really good. Like, 
Robotron's on a bunch of game systems. Sega Genesis. Got that weird Xbox version. Xbox 360 version. It's on 5200. I think it's in the links. Pretty sure it's on the links. Yes, it's on the links. Um, it's not on the 2600. And I don't think it's on the NES, which obviously couldn't handle this. You can imagine the NES would be like spewing fire from its plastic lid, crying for help. I can't play this game. I'm a Nintendo. You know, I actually got to meet Eugene Jarvis a couple years ago to show. You know what he told me? He said that they could not release this game on Nintendo because Nintendo couldn't possibly handle the power of Robotron. I mean, he didn't say that at all. I made it up, but, you know, I feel like it's something he would say, you know. The game says you're saving the last human family. But I, damn it, I question that. What are you saving them from? And, like, where do they go? Like, they don't seem to be in a hurry. I don't think they're running. If anything, I think they're happy to be there. They're in Robotron, the 7800. Who wouldn't want to be there? It's the best version of Robotron! That's not Sega Genesis or the arcade. Game. Like, you expect the Genesis to have an awesome version of Robotron, right? I mean, it's the Genesis. It's got blast processing, 16 bits of high-definition power. Ow. Get over here. 7800 surprises you with its incredible arcade games. Xevious, Galaga, Ms. Pac-Man, Robotron. Nobody admits this now, because people are idiots. But those, those kids who grew up with the NES, they regretted it. They regretted that Christmas or whatever, that they asked for an NES, their friends got a 7800 or Master System. I mean, why would you play Zelda when you can play Fantasy Star? <laughs> That's literally moronic. Anyway. Where was I? Oh yeah, trash talking Nintendo. Oh uh, yeah. Um, Nintendo sucks! Dun, 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 dun. This takes me back to 1986 or so, when my sad friends were playing Ah, oh, you crushed my human! Idiot! My points! When my sad friends were playing Super Mario Brothers. Oh, I feel so sorry for them. I mean, I really don't. <laughs> Who has a career playing video games today? That's right, not them. They're like doctors and lawyers and stuff. But look at me! It's mid-afternoon and I'm playing Robotron. I win. Every time. You know why? Because I grew up with Robotron on the 7800. One of the greatest video games ever made on one of the greatest game systems of all time. 7800. Sega Genesis will also suffice. Stupid brain people, get away from me! Get away from my people! All these blonde ladies. You don't know them! I'm trying to harvest them for their big points. I don't really know them either. Do they have names? I don't care. Oh shoot! I didn't collect the last few for big points! Ah! Ow. Don't take the lady from me! See that? That's some skilled Robotron playing right there. Oh, and I saved the person. And I'm giving that robot the finger, you just can't see it. There, there it is. Now you saw it. I'm gonna laugh at this guy. <laughs> you suck. Come here. Hop. Hop your door. So, what you gotta do in Robotron is desperately try to stay alive. It's pretty hard to do that, actually. And shoot everything that moves. And collect the people for the points. And avoid those things. A little different flow of the game here than the arcade machine. But I think we can all see that this is a pretty awesome version of Robotron. I'm playing this properly with a twin stick. Arcade stick. My, my friend Alan9000 built this for me years ago. I never did get a chance to actually use it in a Robotron review until now. In the future. In the real future. In 2023, which 
Well, pretty much sucks ass compared to 24. <laughs> 2084. In 2084, the world's not really falling apart. Let's say, if anything, it's getting better. And look at this. This is definitely an improvement over what we're dealing with today. Oh, come on! Let's get back to one of my earlier questions. Are we saving these people? Because where do, where do we, where do they go? And what's in this guy's briefcase? It's either Atari 7800 games or malt liquor. Those are the only two things he's carrying. Maybe, maybe both. Oh man, this looks like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Life is short. Let's name this guy before we kill him. This guy's name is Bob. And now he's dead. Sorry Bob. You had to go for comic relief. Oh god, I'm surrounded. <laughs> Bob got his revenge in the next wave. You gotta find a direction to shoot your way through. Get rid of the spawners as quickly as possible because they suck. And then just try not to walk into it. Hey. There you go. Capture that and you can use it as your background or your watch background or your laptop background or whatever. It's beautiful. 2084. The year we make contact and then have to kill them all. What idiot would have asked for an NES when they could have played Robotron? on the 7800. It just boggles the mind. How did Nintendo win the console war? I mean, this is better than the NES. And so is the Master System. So is the ColecoVision. So is the Vectrex. I'm gonna give the NES the edge over the Intellivision. Sorry. For those Intellivision fanboys and girls out there, the, the controller sucks. Come on, not that. Even the NES controller is better than the Intellivision. I mean, smashing your fingers with a hammer is better than the Intellivision controller. Look at the detail on these things. And now I gotta get serious. Oops, there were people to save and I didn't save them. saved, which means I got lots of points. I'm looking at the monitor just thinking, man, that CRT looks nice. It sure does. Especially when it's playing Robotron. Properly. On Atari 7800. Death tanks, laser people, future in 7800 dimensions of awesome. That doesn't really work very well, does it? Oh, gotta break a million. Huh. Which means I need to save more people. Shooting the things is irrelevant. It's the people I need. To stop. See, the people got away. Oh, I was running for my own life. I was being selfish. Oh god, this is hard. How am I gonna break a million when the game keeps killing me? Stop it. I only want to live. Oh boy, this does not bode well. I've got to save all those people real fast. Okay, there's a pathway down here. Yes! I've got an extra guy here before I died. Get to a million! It's not gonna happen. 
But I'm gonna try. I think I'd actually make it through that level. Probably not gonna make it through this one though. Ooh, another extra guy! I'm literally clapping myself. <laughs> I'm applauding my own good work. Go, 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 go! Get the people! Get the people! Save the people! Save the people! Save the people for points! Oh! Oh, I almost broke a million. I was so close. <laughs> Can I change that in editing? I'll use some special effects. Mark got a billion points in Robotron. Asteroids was originally released in 1979 in the arcade. This version for the Atari 7800 has a copyright of 1984. But as I understand it, the Atari 7800 was held back a year or two. Didn't really get a U.S. launch until, what, 1986, I guess. And uh, so I'm assuming that's when people would have had this game. It was about 1986. This is worlds better than Asteroids on the Atari 2600. Uh, not only are the graphics obviously much better and you can actually read the text, but the Asteroids fly all over the place, not just in a straight line up and down. They come at you from the sides. And they're also uh, more rendered and well detailed. And, and they almost appear to be spinning in the vacuum of space. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Asteroids, so if you like Asteroids a lot, you probably owe it to yourself to pick up this version of it. My only real gripe with this game was, was in using the uh, controller, and I used the uh, Nintendo-style two-button Atari 7800 controller that you guys would have gotten in Europe or Australia. Uh, every now and then when you're moving left and right to fire at things, the controller is pretty sensitive and it would just shoot my ship forward uncontrollably. which uh, was quite alarming and would shoot me into a gigantic video game asteroid. Fortunately, using the two buttons on the Atari 7800 controller, the other button is a uh, teleporting device which can move your ship onto the opposite side of the screen and occasionally into the path of an oncoming asteroid. That's about all I can say. Uh, Asteroids is not one of those games that you can talk about for an hour. We could start making up like a whole new story to Asteroids. Why is that spaceship out there in an asteroid field?
Oh yeah, it's like I've said for years, if you're not playing games on Atari 7800 Pro System, then you're an amateur. <laughs> you suck. And speaking of suck, let's take a look at Double Dragon on the Atari 7800 because you have to be a professional to desperately attempt to find any enjoyment in this absolute train wreck of a video game. This is one of the worst games that I've ever played, and that says a lot, because I've played a lot of games. After all, I'm a professional, because I play video games on Atari 7800, but this one is, this one is bad even for 7800 standards. And as, as much as I love the Atari 7800, because back in the day when everyone else around me had an NES, I was playing Xevious and Robotron and Galaga on 7800, but those are all good Atari 7800 games. This is not. Double Dragon is on Karateka level. Like if someone back in the day had a lame party with stale cookies and unspiked punch and invited Jar Jar, Double Dragon for the 7800 would be there playing Karateka while Ninja Golf hooked up with Ms. Pac-Man in the corner. I'm not sure why my mind works this way. It, this, this is just how it's wired. Speaking of wired, who designed the controls for this game? It's, it's unplayable. If you push up and forward, he elbows behind him. If you push down and forward, he does a headbutt, and if you just stand still, you punch, but that does little good because the enemies just come jumping at you and kill you. It's a completely unplayable game, obviously. It looks terrible and sounds even worse. Its only redeeming quality is that this has a two-player simultaneous co-op mode, which I believe the NES version did not, so there's that. This is one of the few examples that, that I can think of in my extremely biased viewpoint where the NES blows away the 7800. <laughs> Come on, Super Mario Brothers sucks compared to Robotron on the 7800, but arguably the 7800 version of Double Dragon sucks compared to the NES one. But they both suck compared to the Master System, and all of them pale in comparison to the Vectrex. So there, there is a hierarchy here. I'm getting off subject because there's nothing else I can say. This game is terrible and you don't want it, so there's, there's that. Just avoid this version of Double Dragon. It's horrible. Horrible! How many synonyms for terrible and horrible and awful can I come up with? Where's the thesaurus? How about... Suck. That's what this game does. And, of course, that means I have to give an extremely sarcastic classic game room shout out and thank you to my friend A-Bomb. Andy the A-Bomb from Wisconsin. Thank you for sending this game. You promised it was going to be bad. It has surpassed my expectations. Double Dragon on the Atari 7800 is very Jar Jar. Especially when compared to games like Ninja Golf on the 7800, which is extremely Lando. Thank you for watching another delightful episode of Classic Game Room on the internet. Unless you're watching this on VHS tape, in which case, thank you. It shouldn't look any worse than it does on screen in real life. This is not one of my recommended games in my ultra-massive video game console guide series on Amazon. Ninja Golf is. So is Robotron. Save your pennies. Don't spend them on Double Dragon. Spend them on double mint gum. Or juicy fruit, that stuff's really good.
This is Ms. Pac-Man for the Atari 7800. And this is a huge step up from the Ms. Pac-Man on the Atari 2600. Uh, you can clearly see the detail in, in the maze and the environment and the ghosts. And when you eat the ghosts after gobbling up a power pellet, the points that you acquire show up on screen. You can see me getting my 1600 points for that. Always hard to get fourth ghost in Ms. Pac-Man. The 7800 version, unlike the 2600 version, brings the intro cut sequences back into the game so we can see Ms. Mr. and Ms. Pac-Man meet and uh, eventually get on their way to mate and create Pac-Man Jr., who does go on to have his own franchise or franchised video game later in his career. I had previously implied in an earlier Classic Game Room HD episode that the Atari 7800 came out after the NES. Uh, that, that's not exactly true. I think in my mind I, I've always felt that was true because when I was a kid I was big into the Atari 2600 and of course when I heard that there was another newer Atari coming out because I didn't have the 5200 which was of course the advanced one. Uh, I had to get the 7800 and my parents were generous enough to buy me one. Then it, then it seemed that everybody else that I knew in school had an NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, I eventually did go on to uh, get an NES a few years later so I could enjoy games like Contra, but uh, Ms. Pac-Man is uh, still still ranked up there as one of my favorites on the, on the 7800. And the 7800 version of Ms. Pac-Man is extremely difficult compared to the 2600 because the speed at which the game plays is way faster. You can see the ghosts are just sprinting along after me. And even though I've got the banana on this level, I still bit the dust. Who defeats? Who defeats is more than just the rivalry between Sega and Nintendo. It's also about the rivalry between Nintendo and Atari. Who defeats? The Atari 7800 Pro System, which plays Nintendo games, or the Super Nintendo that is unable to play Atari cartridges. But the Super Nintendo has Super Metroid and Star Fox and Super Mario Kart. It's a great 16-bit game system. The Atari 7800 Pro System is for professionals. It also plays Atari 2600 games, and it rocks with a monstrous library of games, including Robotron 2084, Joust, and so many others. So I ask you, who defeats Super Nintendo, which is very super, or Atari 7800 Pro System with the power of Atari 2600 and this sweet metallic strip on the front? Oh, this also works with Sega Genesis controllers, by the way. This doesn't, but it's the Super Nintendo, and this is an Atari 7800 Pro system. Who defeats? Let me know here on YouTube and on the Classic Game Room Instagram and Twitter. Who defeats which game system would you rather have? And both of them is the correct answer, but for a Who Defeats video, we, we need to choose. If you had to choose one or the other, which one would you rather have? Which game system is best? Who defeats? Hashtag who defeats? Because you were unable to stop the invading alien hordes, the Earth has been subjected to total annihilation.
Planet Smashers, which has arguably the worst music of any video game ever created. Thankfully, no music plays during the game, but the intro tune is just super darn catchy. If you're deaf. Released in 1990 from Atari, not one of their most exciting Atari 7800 efforts, but an interesting game nonetheless. Especially when you talk about it using voice effects. Just look at the graphics in space, they're amazing! The cartridge artwork is kind of neat, and this is not a common game, so... That's... that's interesting. When playing Planet Smashers, you will probably be the only human on Earth playing it at any given time. And that makes you extremely special. Assuming you're not already extremely special. Which I'm sure you are if you're listening to this show. Planet Smashers plays like most other games in this genre. You fly around the bottom half of the screen and shoot stuff. But it's a very half-assed effort because... It, well, it just is. I love the weapon pickups, for one thing. You start with the best weapon in the game, and picking up any weapon upgrades ruins it. So just avoid the thing with the W, which clearly stands for Worser. Planet Smashers' most interesting feature is that in order to fight the end boss and complete the level, you must collect the colored space gems in a certain order. I know what you're thinking, like, <laughs> Oh man, why didn't Dodon Pachi think of that? Because they didn't have to. Shooting the colored space gem makes it change colors, and you need to collect three of them as indicated on the bottom left of the screen. I think on easy, the color sequence is always the same. So just write it down. Uh, but, but you're not going to, because you won't play this game. Nobody's gonna play this game, because frankly, it's just not that good. It's interesting, but it's not good. This is one of the many games that clearly makes the Atari 7800 better than the NES, because while your friends were playing Metroid, you could play Planet Smashers, and just know that deep down, that made you hardcore. Think about it, logically. It makes a lot of sense, what I just said. Very, yeah. I've got uh, two people to thank for this review. My friend Stuart in Scotland mailed me Planet Smashers and a bunch of other cool, kind of random 7800 games, along with a PAL Atari 7800 that needed some repair work, so my friend David in Chicago fixed it up for me. Apparently the main chip had a few problems, so you might see a few lines streaking through the screen in some of the 7800 reviews, like uh, Fatal Run, which I'm, which I'm playing right now. It's not so apparent in Planet Smashers. Th this is a dull game because you've played it before, and you've played it better. Even if this game does have a cool title. Planet Smashers sounds fun. It sounds, it sounds more fun than it is. If you like these super duper old school straightforward spaceship shooters, I'll recommend Astro Warrior on the Sega Master System. It's a much better game. Or Starjacker on the Sega SG-1000. Or even something like Star Soldier on the NES. Much better games. Look, I'm cloaked! Woo! Planet Smashers has its moments. It's not as bad as Karatika or Double Dragon on the 7800, but it's also not one of the better games in this genre. Worth playing if you have a 7800 and you happen to stumble across a copy. So once again, thanks to my friends Stuart in Scotland and Michael and David in Chicago at retrogame.cyberfreak.com for fixing and modifying the 7800 for composite video output. Not that the game really looks all that good anyway. <laughs> Planet Smashers from 1990. For your Atari 7800 Pro System!
Donkey Kong by Nintendo on Atari 7800. That's right. Donkey Kong on Atari. I love these old Nintendo games on the Atari 2600. And I love Donkey Kong on the Atari 7800, even more than I like regular Donkey Kong. Because it's on the Atari. I'm a big Atari fan, as you know. Monkey business on the monkey bars. Good looking packaging. You don't see anything like this anymore. You are Mario, the fearless carpenter. He's a talented guy. And that big gorilla Donkey Kong has run off with your girlfriend. Uh, One-handed, no less. Look at that. So, I guess pr uh, prior to becoming a plumber, he was a carpenter. I mean, it's good to know multiple things. So, uh, yeah, pretty exciting here. Let's open this up. Take a look at the game cartridge on the inside. I believe this is one of the color ones. A lot of the Atari 7800 games were black and white, or just uh, one color screen printing. Uh, these were usually pretty cheap, as far as the uh, packaging and the inserts go. Uh, well, this one's full color, because it's Donkey Kong. I'm terrible at Donkey Kong, by the way. I reviewed this game years ago. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm out of the 90-day warranty, and uh, here is your, your standard, super cheap Atari 7800 manual and insert. Go Ape! That's right. Tells you how to play it. And again, I reviewed this many, many, many years ago, but uh, today I'm looking at the packaging. Putting this on the shelf in the new Classic Game Room Studio. Part of the Classic Game Room Collection, which you can browse at ClassicGameRoom.com. Make sure to buy your games through my website. Helps the, uh, helps the show. And this is new, by the way. It's new. Um... Came out uh, quite a few years ago, but it's still it's new because it says it's new. So there you go, nice looking box art for Atari 7800's Donkey Kong, and I uh, previously just reviewed previously reviewed the Donkey Kong Junior box art as well, where the Atari Advantage is plastered over Mario's face. Love it. There you go, Donkey Kong. Happy carpentry. This is the Atari 7800 version of Centipede, the classic arcade game that is now being revived in such systems as the Xbox 360 and Xbox Live. And the reason is it's a great game. Not much needs to be said about Centipede that you probably don't already know. You shoot the centipede that comes after you, you avoid the spider, or shoot it. It's a fun game. This this one really is an arcade classic. Now the Atari 7800 version of Centipede is a good version. The 7800 was a good system. Not only was it uh, miles ahead of the 2600 in terms of graphics and gameplay, but it also was backwards compatible and played Atari 2600 games. Sort of like the PlayStation 2 plays PlayStation 1 games. Although they seem to have somehow lost that capability in the uh, PlayStation 3. I loved my Atari 7800, and in fact I still do. All of the Atari games that I capture for Classic Game Room HD are all off of the Atari 7800. It was pretty much the coolest thing going until the NES came out and uh, sunk it.
I don't know what country that helicopter is from, but it's not America. The American flag has 50 stars. The flag on that building has 10 stars. Maybe that's America after the movie Red Dawn. Who knows? Anyway, I think we can all agree that the helicopter in this game has a paint job that would make Airwolf envious. Nobody will see you coming against a blue sky when your helicopter is painted red and white. This is my original game cartridge for my Atari 7D800, and I always assumed that Choplifter was about the uh, hostage crisis back in 1981. According to the designer of the game, it's actually not, but uh, what you're doing in this game is rescuing hostages with a helicopter. You blow up the building that they're in, not damaging any of them, land beside them, pick them up without getting destroyed by airplanes or tanks, and then fly home without running into anything or being shot down. It's a fun game, and was released for everything back in the day. Literally everything. Commodore 64, Atari 5200, Apple II, ColecoVision, NES. I'm not sure if it came out on the ZX Spectrum. Ah, language. I could sure go for a pint of bitter while arguing over what's better, the ZX Spectrum or the ZX Spectrum. Odds are the uh, ColecoVision. Damn, that helicopter's like a clown car. And what is that thing? It's like a squid attached to a hot air balloon. Whatever it is, you don't want to hit it. In fact, you don't want to hit anything, especially when you're carrying the rescued hostages, because then you lose them all. Choplifter, which is not to be confused with Chopper Command from Activision, is an extremely fun and challenging game. Sadly, the Atari 7800 version is just not that exciting compared to, say, the Sega Master System version, which is awesome. Now, I had this back in the day, and I loved it. Picking it up and playing it again leaves me wanting to play uh, one of the other versions of Choplifter, because the game just ends so abruptly, no matter how well you do. It's like they just stopped halfway through while programming it. Being bombed is probably the most dangerous thing in this game. When you're picking up your hostages, you want to make sure that you're really on the lookout for that fighter jet that comes by and bombs you. The tank can also shoot you, but they're fairly easy to uh, destroy, those nice low-profile tanks. They look like they're squashed. The maximum amount of points in the far right column on the top of the screen there, you see how they have three numbers. The uh, middle number is how many rescued hostages you're carrying, the right number is how many you've saved, and the left number is bad. When you're landing, you want to make sure to aim for the middle of the anarchy symbol. The maximum score in the right column that you can get at least is 64. Like the Commodore 64. It's fairly easy to lose some hostages actually, because the tanks will shoot them and you can land on them by accident. They just don't get out of the way. Other versions of this game have other levels beyond just this desert level. The Atari 7800 cartridge does not. You're playing this game to see if you can get 64. Which was fun back in the day, but picking it up again, I'm impressed at the technical quality because the gameplay actually works quite well. Graphically, it's not anything extraordinary. But as I've always said, I'm, I'm very impressed with the Atari 7800 itself. It's backwards compatible. But this game suffers the fate of many Atari 7800 games. It leaves me wanting more. Because I know it could do more. At least I have excellent game cartridges for Xevious, Galaga, and Joust. Choplifter was fun to revisit, but to be honest, there's better versions of Choplifter out there which you'll see during my Sega Master System review of Choplifter, which looks like a totally different game. And it has more than one level. If you think it looks fun, it is. This is a really cool game. It kind of has wonky flight controls, which adds to the challenge, no matter what version you play. So uh, hunt down a version of Choplifter somewhere. 
Maybe, uh, for the Apple II. So instead of playing that skiing game where you skied between the exclamation points, or instead of playing Oregon Trail, try Choplifter. There's a lot more explosions, and nobody starves to death. Are you a professional hockey player? No? Do you want to be a pro system hockey player? Well, you're in luck because this is hat trick on the Atari 7800 Pro System for professionals only. It's like all the fun of hockey without actually getting cold or beaten up. Hat trick on the Atari 7800. From 1987, a game that really captures the spirit of the sport, but it actually doesn't. So just ignore that comment, it's not a good game. But it's got some kick-ass music, woo woo, boop 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 boop. How anybody thought the 7800 would compete against the NES with a hockey game like this is beyond me. One versus one. Of course you're going to score a hat trick if you score three points. They're, you're the only one on the ice! Except for the goalie, I, I guess. The, uh, the biggest letdown here is that, it, well, it's not good, but also nobody throws hats on the ice when you get a hat trick. That's the whole point of getting a hat trick. Free hats! Which is why you should always wear an old crappy hat to hockey games. You don't want to be the asshole that doesn't throw your hat onto the ice, or steal your kid's hat and throw it. That's good parenting. That was some solid defense right there. This game absolutely sucks versus the computer. There's a novice mode and expert mode, and uh, on, on the expert mode, the computer actually tries, so I'll give it that. But any game with a Zamboni can't be all bad. If you play Hat Trick at all, it should be played against a friend or nemesis. Two-player, it's like multiplayer in the same room. These are the actual Atari 7800 controllers that we'll be using to play Hat Trick, and let's see how awesome this game is. Let's do it. Two-player. Atari. <sighs> I am the Vectrex <laughs> Champions of Mars. You are the Red Wings. Don't need to tell you which team is better. Go! Oh, jeez. Get! I don't even want a hat trick. Just give me one point. So here's what you do. You just skate around the ice and shoot. I tried to keep getting into a fight with Brandon, so we just took it outside after the game and I used a chainsaw. Far more effective than fists. It's impossible to shoot, like, anywhere. It's impossible to actually aim your shot in this game. Yeah, I've noticed. Oh, don't, for don't forget, you will be playing offense. Damn it! Woo! Can I take your goalie out? Friggin' Ryan Miller and goal over here, what is this? Which reminds me, a copy of this game was sent to the show by our friend Ben from Buffalo, New York. Oh. Denied a hat trick in hat trick. It's okay though, nobody actually throws hats on the ice. Oh, you get it! You got it. Uh, Here's your hat. Achievement unlocked. Can you crash the Zamboni? <laughs> I wish you could control him. Oh, no, you can't. You should be able to Zamboni over somebody. Oh, yes! That was cheap. Yes, it was. That's how I scored. <laughs>
And now I'm just gonna keep the puck away from you the rest of the game. I'm gonna skate over here, I'm gonna do circles, a little pirouette. Doop -doo -doo, doop -doo -doo. Woo -hoo. <laughs> die! Die! Get off my goalie. Die! <laughs> So thanks again to Ben from Buffalo. Hours of fun can be had playing Hat Trick if your NES is broken or you've lost Nintendo Ice Hockey and Blades of Steel. I'm gonna check your goaltender. Uh, Into the hospital with you. you leave my goaltender alone. I'm gonna stab somebody with my ice skates. Can I hit you with stick? I am Matt Cook. <laughs> Aim at the goal, you... <laughs> Does not field hockey. <laughs> you suck. Oh, come on. <laughs> what is wrong with this game? Yes. This is bullshit. Someone needs to go back in time and make a jingle for the Atari opening screen on the 7800. Kind of like the Sega thing, you know, Sega. Except when Atari pops up, it should go, Nintendo sucks. How much Doug could a dig dug dig if a dig dug could dig dug? So much dugging. So much digging. And such terrible music on the Atari 7800. I love dig dug. But I think even more importantly, I love the Atari 7800 version of dig dug. Haha! <laughs> Suckers. Because this is the version of Dig Dug that I grew up on. And nothing brings me back to those carefree days of being a kid. Like the Atari 7800 Pro System. I know I've talked about this before, but I'm a proud Atari 7800 kid. That's right. When everyone else around me was playing NES and talking about Super Mario Brothers and Metroid, I was all about Dig Dug, Robotron, and Joust on my Atari 7800 Pro System, which is why I'm a professional today. <laughs> Look at this game. Looks like Dig Dug. It's great. Dig Dug is great. Time. It was like 1986-87, my parents lived in this ranch house, we lived in this ranch house, and you know, ranch houses back in the day all had like, sweet basement game rooms, right? At least that's how I remember it. Shag carpet, wood paneling on the walls. It was the 80s. And I just hang out down there and I had this Atari 7800, I guess I had a 2600 first. Got the 2600 Junior, a little bit late. Probably like uh, 86 or so I got the 2600 Junior. Maybe it was 87 I got the 7800. That would add up. But I had a bunch of Atari 2600 games, and I suspect that's the reason I chose the 7800. Also, I'm not sure if I even knew about the NES until started seeing them around. Like, this was before the internet, so it's not like you just heard about all this stuff. The murderous killing machine from the future! He's smiling behind that mask. You know he is. A sadistic grin. Before he bike pumps enemies to death. Burning people with monsters and squashing them under boulders in Dig Duck. And yes! Right in the ass with the bike pump. Particularly horrible way to go. Alright, anyway, where was I? Uh, 1980s game room. And in the corner of this game room. Ooh, good one. In the corner of this game room. Sat. 
your 11 or 12 year old friend Mark, who had erected a video game lair. Uh oh. Miss, don't make me miss my onion. I like onions. <laughs> I'm back here. <laughs> nice. Uh oh, this one's trying to make a run for it. No, you don't. Stupid enemies. All right. Anyway, in the corner of this room sat this uh, wooden, like wood grained 1970s style folding table. Because for whatever reason, my dad had like a dozen of these things. I don't know when he got them or where or why. He just loved these giant wooden, wood grain folding tables. Sturdy construction. And. Ooh, I get a mushroom. I don't even like mushrooms, but I do like big points. So I'm gonna get the mushroom. So we had this, uh, this, this folding table, upon which sat a 13-inch white kitchen TV, like, you know, old-school 1980s kitchen TV, before people would just watch, you know, cooking shows on their phones or whatever. We had uh, a dedicated kitchen TV, but I guess my mom must, not, must have not wanted it in the kitchen or whatever, because I got it. And uh, that was my video game TV. So I plugged in my Atari 7800. Woo! And that's where I played Dig Dug, Robotron, Joust, Donkey Kong Jr., Xevious, on the Atari 7800 Pro System, which is why I am a professional video gamer today. I mean, look at that move. That's not an amateur move right there. That's a pro move. Yeah, so I just sit there playing these games on this wood-grained folding table. Which, by the way, I still have all these tables today. In fact, Classic Game Room is edited on one of these tables. It's possible that Classic Game Room is edited on the exact same table that I used for my video game lair. Huh? How about that? There's some useless information to get you through your day. Here it is to help complete the visual. One of those wood grain tables, got two of them here. <laughs> Still in use. This is possibly the same table that I played 7800 on back in the day. Or maybe it's that one. One of the two. Sup, Dig Dug? Wish I could remember the exact day that I uh, got a 7800. I don't. But I remember the feeling of playing Atari 7800. It's just this beautiful feeling of nostalgia. When everybody around me seemed to have an NES all of a sudden. I was busy playing my 7800 Pro System. Oh boy, hey, uh oh. <laughs> like, I didn't get an Atari 2600 until a bit later. Like, I, you, th you probably think I had one of the wood grained ones in like 81 or 82. I did not actually have one of the wood grained ones in 81 or 82. It was not until about 1986 when uh, my mom finally got me a 2600 Junior. The uh, same one that I use today for Class Gamer. They all went on sale. Like, I, I distinctly remember that she must have been in like a good mood or something. I don't know what it was, but she like went out and bought like the 2600 Junior and a whole bunch of games that just came in like generic white boxes. Like, I'm assuming this is when everything was just going on fire sale. Like, the NES was out. I'm so gonna get my ass burned here. <laughs> Ha! Stupid enemies. Run! 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 Ha <laughs> ha! A murderous killing machine from the future! Ow! Lost my tomato. Damn it. Where was I? Oh yeah. 
So my mom got me a whole bunch of Atari games on sale. And it was like Christmas. Probably, probably because it actually was Christmas. I don't know, but I loved Atari 2600 so much. I played the hell out of my 2600. So I think what happened is the 7800 came out. I probably saw this in like the Sears catalog or something. You know, before the internet, we all relied on the Sears catalog, which was of course better than the internet. Um, ah, man. Because the Sears catalog just had pages upon pages of dreams. I guess all this rambling brings me to one, one, one point, which is that it's always fun to talk about the 7800 because it just brings me right back to that basement and that folding table and that white kitchen TV and just a time that was just better than it is today as everything descends into chaos. The 7800 is there to put me in a good mood. So what I liked about the 7800 most of all is that the games looked better. I mean, the Atari 2600 was pretty cool, but, you know, most of the games were pretty rudimentary. Well, along comes the 7800, and here we've got arcade quality graphics. And look at this. This looks more or less like the Dig Dug arcade machine. It's a pretty simple game for the most part. In fact, Dig Dug plays perfectly well on the 2600, but the 7800 version just looks better. And it's got music. The music's not very good, but, you know. I mean, this is like arcade quality graphics here, people. From the future, 1987. Yes. You stupid pukas and figars, come on. I sacrifice myself for big points. <laughs> That's how it's done, professionally. So it wasn't until my uh, friend down the street got an NES that I started to question my loyalty to the Atari 7800. I hate to admit it. Oh, man, the first time I saw Super Mario Brothers, I was just like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't admit that, because this is Atari fanboy mark. I'll cut that out in editing. I'm sure I damaged those brain cells at some point in my life, so... That's probably not the correct memory. First time I saw an NES, I was like, what a plastic piece of junk! Yeah, that's right. You know, there was nothing impressive about Metroid. I guess the moral of this story here is that the Atari 7800 made me not just a professional, but a man. A man who can squash two enemies with one boulder for big points. Professional graphics, look at that. You can make out every detail of those pukas being squashed under boulders. You can almost feel their pain and hear their screams. Listen. You hear that? I mean, that was Mark made sound effects, but that doesn't change my statement. The 7800's awesome. It's a great version of Dig Dug. Like, I love Dig Dug. There's just so many different ways to score points, and a lot of different strategies. Like, you get the most points, obviously, by squashing the enemies under boulders, also collecting the food items. Eventually, the game picks up speed, and it gets crazy difficult. That was a good one. Nice. This guy's coming to get some. And there he goes, he got some. Now I'm getting a mushroom. But that's not some dumb Mario mushroom. That's a Dig Dug mushroom. That's an acceptable mushroom. Here, I, I zoomed in everyone so we can witness the graphic violence in Dig Dug. In high definition. Look at this. Look at it. Oh, it's just he shot a hole right through him. Oh, like little bits and pieces of that puka splattered everywhere. Help! <sighs> we sure that's a bike pump. He had like Top Gun. Top Gun's pretty much what sold me on an NES eventually. I think when I saw Top Gun, I was like, oh my god, I must have this. It wasn't Mario or Metroid that did it, it was Top Gun. 
mean, of course it was Top Gun. Everybody loved Top Gun in 1987. It was the coolest thing ever. Ow. I got burned. I love the way that Dig Dug plays on the 7800. It's great. I was playing the arcade game like two weeks ago. This is almost identical. In fact, one might say it's even better because it's more professional. What? With it being on the Atari 7800 Pro System at all. I mean, the, the Pro System's weak link was its controller, but there's easy ways to get around that now. I'm using an arcade stick at the moment, but you know. This is the future. Woo, look at that. Killed enemies in stereo. I mean, the future's horrible, but we do have better controllers for video games. Maybe one of the only good things about the future. Let's think about that for a moment. What are, what are things that are actually better in the future? Because it seems like reality is pretty much falling apart right now. So, like, what is actually good about the future? All right. So we got better video game controllers. I'm gonna argue that beer is better. The beer is definitely better in the future. I mean, not like I was drinking beer in 1987, but I'm confident that the beer tastes better now. Let's see what else. What else is better in the future? TV, definitely not. TV sucks. Future TV. Real future TV. And the problem is that the actual future is not like Buck Rogers in the 25th century. If it was, then the future would be better. Ah! I mean, if for no other reason, Aaron Gray alone. Uh oh. Let's start picking these things off one at a time here. Yes! Did I record that? Oh, I did. I think that was my proudest Dig Dug move ever. So I was the only kid that I knew back in the day who had an Atari 7800. <laughs> You ruined my story! My heartfelt, passionate story. Destroyed by a Figar. <laughs> Nintendo sucks! I mean, surely something must be better in the future than the 80s. But other than video game controllers and beer, I'm coming up blank on this. Like, music was better in the 80s, movies, TV, video games, pop culture. If you live in the Midwest, hairstyles never left the 80s. I mean, the future in Blade Runner looks like a downright utopia compared to the real future. So you know what? I'm just going to give up and just, I'm just going to call it. The only thing better about the future is video game controllers and beer. Period. Point. Game. Dig Dug. Look at Mario Go. This is Donkey Kong on the Atari 7800. And I really haven't played Donkey Kong in the arcade. I probably have once or twice. Uh, I played Donkey Kong on the Atari 2600 a, a good bit because that's the game system that I had it on. And I was never really that big a fan of Donkey Kong. And always wondered why everybody else was but me. Now, I finally got Donkey Kong on the Atari 7800, and I have to imagine this looks much more like the arcade version than the Atari 2600 uh, version of the game does. For one thing, we have three levels here instead of just two, and in typical Atari 7800 fashion, the sounds and the graphics are actually quite nice uh, for an arcade game. 
And that's something that I think they did very well for the Atari 7800 with games like Galaga and Ms. Pac-Man and Dig Dug. And uh, Donkey Kong on the Atari 7800 does not disappoint. This is a fun game. This version of the game was released in 1988 on the Atari 7800. And each time you get through a level, you get bonus points depending on how quickly you get through it. You also get points by jumping over the barrels and smashing the barrels or the sparks with the hammer. Most of this stuff wasn't nearly as much fun in the Atari 2600 version. The 7800 makes this game tremendously enjoyable. The Atari 7800 box, which is in pristine condition by the way, these things hold up quite nicely after 20 years, has some pretty interesting stuff on the back. And the description is, you are Mario, the fearless carpenter. Now I always assumed Mario was a plumber, but sure enough, in this game, he's a carpenter prior to his career as a plumber. Anyway. The Fearless Carpenter and that big gorilla Donkey Kong has run off with your girlfriend. It's up to you to struggle up those ladders and balance on those beams to rescue your lady fair. She's held captive at the very top, but Donkey Kong is not ready to give her up so easily. He's tossing barrels and fireballs at you at every turn. It's up to you to outmaneuver that wily ape. Good luck. Your lady awaits. After Donkey Kong falls and hits his head on the iron beams, Mario and his girlfriend gaze into each other's eyes lovingly as symbolized by the heart between them. I think that Ms. Pac-Man did a better job with their interlude scenes showing the progression of the relationship between Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man. And the eventual arrival of Pac-Man Jr. Now the fact that Mario is a carpenter changes everything. Now this gives some backstory to Mario because I want to know what happened to make him change careers from carpentry to plumbing. How did Mario get in this situation where Donkey Kong, a giant ape, captured his girlfriend and why is there an enormous barrel of oil next to Mario in the first level and for that matter why does Mario have to climb ladders and run across beams and jump on elevators to save his girlfriend all of this raises a lot of questions that are not answered in Donkey Kong but then again that is the beauty of arcade games because there is never an explanation to any of them and that's what makes them so much fun. It's like when Star Wars tried to explain the force with midichlorians. That basically ruined the whole damn thing. They should have just left it as some mysterious energy force that had no explanation just as Donkey Kong has no explanation for why Mario is in the predicament he's in. Maybe the ape ran a carpentry supply store and Mario's check bounced. This is Joust for the Atari 7800, the Pro System. 
Joust arrived in the arcades in 1982 and was published by Williams. And I think this, this game is brilliant. I think this is one of the most ingenious arcade games ever made. Now if we look at this game as an arcade game, it has a lot in common with another game that I really enjoy called Robotron 2084, also by Williams. The whole concept of an arcade game, unlike a home system, was to get people to stand there at the arcade game and put quarters into the machine. Now you'd obviously want to have those games being played as short as possible so the people standing there would put in as many quarters as possible to keep playing. And Joust and Robotron both excel at that because they're both extremely fun, but very, very challenging. And typically the games don't last that long, unlike uh, Ms. Pac-Man, for instance, which I'm much better at Ms. Pac-Man, so I can stand there and hog the Ms. Pac-Man machine for quite some time, whereas on Joust or Robotron, you get blown off the arcade machine pretty quick, because they're very tough games. Especially if you don't have the system at home to be able to sit there and master it, and that was certainly the case in the early 1980s. Joust was brought over to the home systems uh, in 1983, it came out on the Atari 2600, and this version of Joust for the Atari 7800 uh, came out a few years later in 86 or 87. And this is a very faithful representation of the arcade Joust. We have pretty much all the features in the original game. We have the hand that comes up and tries to grab you from the lava. The eggs land and sit there and they hatch uh, little joust guys. And I mean, I, this is just ingenious. One of the reasons this game is great and unique and challenging is the way that you control your bird. You flap the wings with your button and you just use a joystick to control it. So you have to actually master piloting this bird around screen, which is very difficult. It won't change directions instantly like a game like Ms. Pac-Man or Dig Dug or something. It's uh, much more challenging to get the bird to go where you want it to go and that actually creates most of the challenge in the game. There's a wonderful variety of ways to get points. You get points by killing your enemies, by collecting their eggs. You get more points if you get the eggs in midair right after you hit them. The enemies increase in difficulty from red to gray to blue. You have pterodactyls that come at you. This is that classic two-dimensional arcade style that they need to make more of today. Just think what they could do if they made Joust 3 for the 360 or PS3. Joust has some tremendous packaging art. Yet one thing I never understood about Atari 7800 game cartridges, for the most part, is that they had just this black and white image on a silver cartridge, unlike the very colorful Atari 2600 cartridges. I suppose that was to differentiate them from one another, but I think the Atari 7800 cartridges look boring. They probably could have done something else than just black and white on silver, unless they already knew the 7800 was a complete failure because it was getting its ass handed to it by the NES, and they were just trying to save costs by doing a black and white print job. And uh-oh, if you stay on screen too long, the pterodactyls come out to get you, so you can't take too long to clear out the level. For all these reasons, I think that Joust is one of the best arcade games ever made. And it may not be as famous today as Pac-Man or Cubert, because it doesn't have uh, like a cute central character. But I can just theorize now, they wanted to get the most money into those machines that they could, and Joust and Robotron had to just be fantastic games at doing that. I love the screeching tire sound the bird makes when it comes to a stop. It reminds me of the Wile E. Coyote cartoons. This game suspends disbelief so well that you actually believe that's what the bird sounds like when it's coming to a stop. Now we've seen Joust on pretty much every video game system ever since the Atari 2600. 
And now Joust can be played on the Xbox Live game console, and Classic Game Room HD will hopefully be reviewing that soon. But like many arcade titles, the game falls short when played with a gamepad, and especially the Xbox controller, which I really don't care for, for arcade games. It's pretty good for shooting games, but not so much for arcade titles where you have to mash that button. And Joust can be taxing on your button-pushing finger, because you have to continually hammer away at that button, especially when you're trying to rapidly gain some height. I first played Joust on the Atari 7800, and when I grew up I had a 7800 and a couple games. I didn't have as many games as it probably sounds now that I'm doing a review show, but in the very beginning I had Joust, I had Robotron 2084, I had Xevious, and those were my favorite games on the 7800, and I played them a lot. So this is the first format in which I saw Joust. I didn't even have this game on the 2600. The good thing about Joust is it's a great game no matter what game system you play it on because it doesn't rely on specifically just graphics to make it fun. It's fun because you're flying a giant bird around with a big staff trying to stab your opponents in the head, but in reality what you want to do is not stab them but land on them with your giant bird ass. But that wouldn't have made nearly as sexy and as exciting a game title as Joust. Like, it probably wouldn't sound as cool if you said that you had the high score in bird ass. Joust is certainly a, a, a better title. Say, Timmy, what are you going to do with those quarters at the arcade? Well, I'm gonna put them into bird ass. Timmy? Don't ever go to the arcade again. When I was a kid, Mario Brothers for the Atari 2600 was one of my favorite games on the Atari, and to this day I still think it's one of the best Atari 2600 titles that they ever made. The gameplay and the graphics are tremendous and very well made on the Atari. Recently I picked up the Atari 7800 version of Mario Brothers, and wow does this take it one step further. I mean, the Atari 7800 is really one of the most impressive game systems, and one of the most underappreciated in my opinion. It really excelled at arcade games, and that's what this game is. I don't remember playing Mario Brothers in the arcade, so I can't comment on how this compares directly to it. But this game is a lot of fun, it has a definite 80s arcade graphical style, it feels good, the gameplay is good, it's challenging, it adds a lot more complexity to Mario Brothers than you find in the Atari 2600 game. Depending on where you hit the blocks from underneath, you can bounce the animals left or right or straight up. That means you can knock them back a step, as you see I'm doing with the crabs, or you can knock them off the ledge right into, right into you so you can collect the points for them. They speed up when you get to the last one, so this game has some improvements and some differences over the 2600 version. I 
like these things. They look like little Mothras. Mothras, without a doubt, probably my favorite of the Japanese monsters from the Godzilla series, which I've seen every Godzilla movie about ten times. In fact, we should really get to some Godzilla-related video games here on Classic Game Room. But in the meantime, we've got Nintendo's main man, Mario, who's still producing I don't know how many games. I mean, this guy must be so filthy rich. He probably doesn't even have to do any plumbing anymore. He can just sit back and live off the money he's making from video games. Check that out, the ice lands and then it freezes the whole shelf. You can compare this up against the 2600 version with my previous review. And if you're into arcade games, I think that uh, it's definitely worth the investment to pick up an Atari 7800 because there's so many great arcade titles for it and it also plays the Atari 2600 games. And I can tell you with experience, that game system will last 22 some years without having a problem. So I'd like to see the uh, new game systems have that same track record. The year is 2000XX. The future is terrible. Everything sucks except that Classic Game Room is bringing you the review of Ninja Golf. Again. The golf course is a dangerous place and you need to be prepared. That's why you should be a professional. Atari 7800 Pro System Gamer before tackling Ninja Golf. But these days, I guess we'll make exceptions. Maybe you can enjoy this game on the PlayStation 5. It can barely handle it. I think my PS5 was overheating at the mere mention of Ninja Golf. And then you throw games like Tempest 2000 in there and the thing starts smoking. It's like it needs more blast processing just to handle this. Or at least a nice stainless steel strip and a little rainbow for that added bit of professionalism. I lost my train of thought. That's how things go around here. This game's great. And if you haven't played it, you just haven't lived. Golfing and ninja-ing together in one game. Whoever invented this is a genius. This game has everything, even sharks. You gotta kick them right in the nose. There's also giant frogs, and I think those are gophers, groundhogs, I don't know, deformed rabbits. They throw ninja stars at you or whatever. Maybe the Atari 7800 created its own life form. It was, after all, professional and ahead of its time when a bunch of losers were playing the NES, us cool kids were playing the 7800. You can take your Mario and shove it. We got Ninja Golf and Karateka. Probably shouldn't admit that one, though. Hitting that dragon in the face with a ninja star is harder than it looks. Hey, the best way to play ninja golf is on the Atari 7800 Pro System. But I am very pleased to see that whoever it was that made this collection included it in the Atari 50th Anniversary Collection, playing it here on the PlayStation 5. 
so you can admire all the beauty of Ninja Golf in 8K, and you can hear the sound effects and that amazing musical score in 12.5 surround sound. Bet you didn't expect this one. Me neither. Didn't think anybody would actually watch this show, but here it is. You're watching Ninja Golf. I win. Somebody could have been playing Fortnite right now, but instead, you know they're going to go play Ninja Golf. I love how you set up your shot, and you take, you take your swing on the golf course, then you run and fight bad guys. Eventually, it gets impossibly difficult because the controls suck, but that's part of the game's charm. If it was too good, it wouldn't be good at all. Don't overthink that one. That's right, kids. Don't go out like an amateur. Live life like a professional on the Atari 7800. Or whatever game system will play this. As long as you're playing Ninja Golf, you're winning. Even if you're losing. Which you're not. Because you're winning. Because you're playing Ninja Golf. What year is this? This is Robotron 2084 on the Atari 7800. Two great numbers that go well together. And not to sound all cheesy and emotional and lame, but this game holds a special place in my heart. Because this is the first version of Robotron 2084, one of my favorite games that I ever played. Back in the day in 1986 or 1987, when I was fortunate enough to get an Atari 7800, I spent hours parked in front of our old 13-inch kitchen television. Remember those really old ones that had knobs on the front? You'd get them like Sears or something. Had to use the RF adapter and the thing had an antenna. The first couple games I had for my 7800 were Robotron 2084, Joust, and Xevious. And I loved this game. I played this all the time. I don't remember how good I was or how far I got. I didn't get to spend a lot of time in the arcades because, you know, I couldn't drive there or anything. So I was definitely one of the first generations of American kids to grow up with home video game consoles. And this is one of the games I played the most, so I have very fond memories of it. And there's some differences right away from this version and the Xbox Live version and also the PlayStation version we're getting to here on Classic Game Room HD. The graphics are tremendous. I mean, they're, they're not as good as they are on the, uh, the newer consoles, because there's an awful lot going on in Robotron 284. But you can clearly make out the family, the man, the woman, and the child, and all the different enemies that you have to slaughter. It's pretty obvious why this game was not made for the Atari 2600, or at least one of the reasons why is I don't think it would look very good at all, because you couldn't have gotten this kind of detail and this many enemies on screen at one time. This version of the game also has four different levels. You have Novice, Intermediate, Advanced, Expert, and there's also a challenge. I actually forget what the challenge level was all about, but, but I'm playing on the Intermediate level here just so I could rock through the game. And as I said in uh, some of the previous reviews on Robotron 2084, I, th I think this is one of the most difficult, challenging games ever made. And as an arcade game, this is brilliant because this must have eaten so many quarters from people who play these quick Robotron 2084 games and kept coming back for more because it was so much fun. In the intermediate gameplay mode here, the enemies come at you a bit slower, the tanks don't spawn as quickly, and it's pretty easy to wipe out the brains on the brain levels and then collect all the humans. So you get a lot more extra lives. The advanced and the expert levels are, as you might expect, a good bit more difficult. 
and bring the game back up to the level that you would normally play it at in the arcade or on the Xbox Live or PlayStation versions. On the Atari 7800, you could either play this game with one controller or two controllers. With one controller, you would only fire in the direction that you were moving, which kind of defeats the entire purpose of Robotron 2084. With two controllers, you could play the normal way. One controller to move, one controller to fire. If you've watched my Atari 7800 vs. PlayStation 3 review, you saw what the Atari 7800 controllers over here in the United States looked like, so this was not an easy game to play with two controllers. Capturing the footage for this review, I used a Sega Genesis controller in the left hand, and then the Atari 7800 controller in my right hand, which which was pretty big. I mean, this thing's actually a very difficult controller to use with one hand, so I don't even remember how I did this when I was a kid. But once you get over the awkwardness of playing with two controllers, this is a good version of Robotron 2084, and worth checking out if you have the old Atari console and like to get back into the old Atari games. Also, as I mentioned, it's a good bit easier than the standard versions of Robotron 2084. So if you're just starting out with the game and you want to practice, this might be a great version to do that on. The Atari 7800 is built like a tank, so I thoroughly expect this game to also continue working in the year 2084. I don't know why everyone's all worried about the environment now. I mean, it's not going to matter. In the year 2084, we're all going to be running from our lives from killer robots anyway. We'll have bigger problems to worry about than going green. F*** that. Just give me a bigger gun. I got to shoot robots. This is Pole Position 2 for the Atari 7800, which is of course the sequel to Pole Position 1, which came out on the Atari 2600. Now some of the advancements we see here, you have four different tracks, including a couple that are familiar to us who play games like Forza 2 and Gran Turismo today, like Suzuka. And uh, you see the Ferris wheel there in the distance, although not rendered quite as nicely as it is on the Xbox 360 games. Now, Pole Position 2 was a major improvement over the first Pole Position. First of all, the graphics are at least ten times better. And your car doesn't just look like a bunch of blocks. Now it looks like a more refined bunch of blocks. Some other major differences in this version, you qualify for the race. You see I qualified second here, so I'm starting at the front of the pack. There's uh, eight cars in total for each race. Now, although I'm starting out in the front, you'll see coming up on my left is another race car. I'm not sure where he came from, though, because he wasn't actually in with the group of the other cars starting out. Uh, also on this version, you'll notice that there's puddles of water in the road and billboards that advertise Atari just in case you weren't sure what game system you were playing this on. In the distance, we have Mount Fuji. This is the Fuji track in Japan. And Mount Fuji is sort of like the Eiffel Tower. And no matter where you are in France, evidently you can see the Eiffel Tower, according to popular media. No matter where you are in Japan, you can see Mount Fuji. What makes this game challenging and frustrating to play by today's standards is that it's difficult to pass the opposing cars because you can't bump into them or else you instantly explode into a ball of flames. Even though the cartridge says high performance racing at its best, this is far from the best, but still a great improvement over pole position one on the 2600. Thank you for watching, best. Atari 7800 reviews by Classic Game Room. I love the 7800. You probably figured that out by now. This is the game system I grew up on. Before I had an NES and a Genesis and a PlayStation, I was all about Atari. 
7800. It's a great game console to collect for today. It plays Atari 7800 games. It plays Atari 2600 games. And there's a lot of really cool game, really cool games, great arcade games like Robotron 2084, Xevious. And if you're gonna play 7800 today, I recommend that you hunt down one of these. The Atari 7800 gamepad thing. Not, not the traditional US Atari 7800 joysticks. Those are terrible. They wobble around in your hand. They, they, the buttons are in a weird position. They're, they're awful. Get one of these. And, uh, well, if you really want to step up your game, you could get one of these guys. Check this out. Just off camera. Oh, yeah. It's the Atari 7800 Robotron 2084 arcade stick made by my friend Alan9000. So, Alan, if you're watching, this thing is still in heavy use. And I use this for all of my Atari 2600 reviews. And when you play, and when you play Robotron on the 7800, you need two joysticks. So it's perfect. Atari 7800 makes you a professional at everything. The future I want to live in is the future where JCPenney shirts like this and wallpaper like that are normal. That is the future I live in. <laughs>